So good afternoon, dear uh, participants, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is uh, Petrova Natalia. I am a deputy dean of the Department of uh, Healthcare Management uh, in Ranepa. And uh, now today uh, we will talk about uh, global healthcare uh, problem and uh, we will talk about uh, our problems uh, our visions uh, our um, yeah, uh, whole uh, our ideas uh, and uh, now i see that um, as we have uh, we should wait someone else um, i think maybe um, one or two minutes we will wait um, because uh, uh, i i get information that uh, we have a small problem Ah, it's okay. So uh, we will uh, have uh, several uh, our um, colleagues. Uh, Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'm sorry I have a small problem with the uh, uh, connection and um, uh, glad to uh, host you at uh, the event student guide. Are. And uh, uh, my name is uh, Petrova Natalia. I am a uh, vice dean uh, faculty of medicine and healthcare management. And uh, today we will talk about gl uh, global health and uh, uh, sport adaptation reality and uh, trends and uh, a small overview about um, uh, global uh, health care. Uh, the um, COVID-19 pandemic is uh, placing uh, enormous uh, uh, strain on the global health care sectors, workforce, uh, infrastructure and the supply chain and exposing social uh, enacting in uh, health uh, and, COVID and care. COVID-19 is also accelerating change across the uh, whole ecosystem and forcing public and private health system and adapt to innovate and sport period. And number uh, of foundational shifts are arising from uh, and uh, being uh, ex exacerbated by um, COVID-19 spread. Examples include the consumers increasing involvement in healthcare decision making, uh, the rapid adoption of virtual health and other digital innovation, uh, the push for interoperable data and um, uh, data analyst, uh, analytics use. Amid this dynamic uh, governments, healthcare providers, payers, and other stakeholders around the globe uh, are being challenged to quickly pivot and adapt and innovate. We uh, expect industry leaders to use this moment and uh, ignite it by organizational and ecosystem res response COVID-19 to address six precising uh, uh, sectors each year. First of all, um, uh, them uh, is uh, digital transformational and uh, interoperable data. And uh, we should uh, uh, 
transform um, we should make a transformation from standardized uh, clinical protocols uh, to personalized uh, medicine and uh, it will be uh, one of the main uh, trend the second one is work and uh, talent and um, so of course we should uh, new, know about uh, socioeconomic shifts customs and uh, human uh, experience uh, now our customers uh, increase the ownership of their health and data data provision of uh, clear on uh, and uh, concerns uh, information and treatment care and uh, its cost and we should uh, keep a balance between virtual visits and uh, trusted uh, physical relationship and uh, uh, the last one the six care model innovation we should change our focus from acute care to prevention and well-being and uh, it's mainstream uh, in uh, uh, whole medical uh, system and um, and tra uh, transition from uh, standardized uh, clinical protocols to personalized medicine and we uh, prepare a um, special wider course uh, and it, it is available for our students uh, about um, uh, your own uh, health care management and uh, so we in the trend and um, of course, uh, the ecosystem uh, that connect uh, consumers to virtual home and uh, person and um, uh, condition. And uh, today, uh, 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 we don't have uh, any doubt that uh, COVID-19 uh, has an influence global on uh, uh, health and even uh, cause some changes in uh, its concept. Our next speakers will tell us uh, about um, that and uh, present some uh, consequences uh, connected with pandemic and lockdown. So let me introduce incredible Varvara Mironova uh, with uh, her uh, report. Varvara, I, uh, you can start. I'm here. I'm here. But I don't hear you. Uh, I'm here. Is it, is it okay? I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Can, yes, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. um, thank you very much for your uh, invitation. And it's an honor for me to participate in this uh, interesting uh, event. And I will be speaking about a very important issue uh, connected with the infectious diseases because my field field of expertise is uh, the spread of infectious diseases so uh, i'll be speaking about infectious diseases in the context of, of global health challenges i will of course i'll be speaking about covid covid 19 uh, as well but uh, i will speak about other problems too thank you uh, ne next please <coughs> next slide please uh -huh. Okay. So, uh, in public perception, uh, the most uh, serious global threats that uh, can uh, uh, that can can be can be dangerous for uh, our ecosystem, for our environment, and for our health are the next. So, global warming, environmental pollution, energy resources shortage, uh, and uh, and uh, other issues uh, that we discuss in media, in public uh, society. In with different forms and so on and so forth and uh, we can highlight uh, that uh, we can we can notice that some of them are uh, directly or indirectly co uh, connected to human health and uh, and particularly to infectious diseases next please just just uh, just before um, the start of uh, this pandemic, in uh, the end of 19, uh, 2019, uh, the WHO, World Health Organization, provided uh, its own list of 10 biggest global health threats. And of course, uh, air pollution and climate change uh, that affect every 
um, everything you know on our planet, uh, including health and including um, infectious diseases and other. You can see I highlighted different different uh, several several issues from this list that are also related to infectious diseases and uh, now number six. They were speaking about Ebola because nobody knew about the about uh, COVID nineteen at at the, at the time. But uh, this number six, uh, six Ebola, Ebola and high threat pathogens were among the most the biggest global health threats. As if we are speaking about climate change, please next slide. Uh, so just just a small example this is uh the example of malaria which is climate uh, sensitive clim climate um, dependent disease and here is the estimation for uh, next 20 years for africa uh, that uh, shows us that the climate change will uh, change change glo uh, global temperatures and environment in a way that it will the, that this environment will be more uh, suitable for malaria transmission and uh, this is the only case but if we'll speak about other climate sensitive uh, diseases such as uh, for example uh, west nile fever or dengue fever or zika fever or many others we may find a uh, very similar uh, very similar trends so that's why we uh, we look at climate change as uh, one of the global uh, problems uh, related to this issue. And uh, actually, if we will we'll be speaking about uh, some diseases that may be not so uh, so clearly uh, related to climate, for example, COVID nineteen. In this case, we can speak about uh, an indirect influence because uh, uh, it is um, uh, it, it depends on um, it, it 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 affects uh, uh, hosts maybe vectors and uh, environment itself and uh, next slide please and uh, uh, the most serious problem in relation uh, with um, uh, infectious diseases the most uh, the most serious problem is uh, so called emerging and reemerging diseases so uh, these are diseases that can be defined as infections that have newly appeared in a in a population or have existed but are rapidly increasing in incidence or geographic range and uh, uh, specific fa factors precip uh, precipitating this disease emergence can be identified in virtually all cases. Uh, these include, include ecological, environmental, demographic factors that place people at uh, increased contact with uh, pathogens. Uh, and some of these uh, pathogens may be previously unfamiliar. Yeah, And uh, there are maybe two step process of emergence. First of all, the introduction of the agent in the new host population uh, <clears throat> and uh, establishment and further, uh, further dissemination within the new host population or adoption. And this is the case of COVID-19. Next, please. So you can see here the two definitions of emerging and re-emerging diseases. I think it's very imp important uh, things to know. And there can be entirely new infections such as uh, SARS, uh, MERS, COVID-19, and so on. New diseases in a specific geographic region, for example, West Nile fever in North America that spread in, uh, in the middle of 19th, spread over the full territory of the United States, uh, except Alaska, uh, re-emerging uh, in the region after, uh, after a long absence, for example, dengue, uh, dengue fever in the southern United States, and the very bad problem with the antibiotic-resistant bacteria uh, or drug-resistant uh, tuberculosis. So all these cases are uh, now at um, uh, are very urgent, very important, and very uh, broadly discussed. Next, please. Uh, another issue is the so-called transboundary animal diseases because uh, people works at uh, work at uh, agriculture and. Uh, 
Uh, there are a lot, uh, a long list of uh, highly contagious and transmissible epi epidemic diseases of livestock, which are, uh, which have the capability for rapid spread. And many emerging infectious diseases are also transboundary diseases because they can spread regardless of national, na national borders. So this is another problem. And uh, in the present scenario of uh, our globalization, these TADs represent a very serious threat to the economy and welfare and public health and so on and so forth. Next, please. And worst of that, um, among these uh, TADs uh, that have zoonotic manifestations, so when animals get, got sick with uh, these diseases, a number of, of infectious diseases are dangerous for humans. And here is very short, but very um, threatening list of these diseases. And uh, they are, uh, as, as usual, they are very severe and dangerous for humans because, because humans are not uh, appropriate host for this pathogen. So the pathogen is not, is not adapted to human host. So humans can, be, uh, can, uh, can ill very, um, in, a, in, in a very hard way. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> So how, how, how does it work? Some major factors that underlie disease emergence and reemergence. It may be some genetic adaptation uh, and uh, some, some issues connected with the agent itself. It may, may be some in issues connected with human host, for example, human susceptibility to infection, human demographics and behavior, international trade and travel, intent to harm, bioterrorism, and that was <laughs> we discuss it very often in connection with anthrax, for example, and even uh, for um, COVID-19, though I don't believe that uh, that, uh, that it's true, but uh, there, was, uh, there, there was a discussion. And of course, the change in environment, the ch climate change, uh, change in ecosystems, economic development, and the changes in land use, in technology, industry, uh, poverty and so social inequity and so on so, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, we in our global world we have a lot of uh, uh, problems connected, closely connected which, uh, to each other that uh, may uh, promote dissemination of uh, infectious diseases over the globe. Next please. And uh, there were talks uh, about uh, the upcoming pandemic. And uh, these talks st started uh, from uh, the beginning of 21st century, when uh, the uh, epidemic of uh, so-called SARS outbreak brought to la uh, br uh, be, uh, st started uh, to spread and it brought to light the risk posed by emerging diseases and also highlighted the fact that they represent a worldwide trend. Uh, to our uh, luck, th that epidemics uh, uh, could not uh, could not um, could not um, be uh, uh, it, it, it did not did, didn't spread over over the globe and uh, it didn't uh, didn't uh, turn to pandemic but uh, since that time uh, the um, people specialists and sanitary work, workers health uh, healthcare workers uh, talk about uh, the uh, inevitable uh, appearance of uh, a new infectious agent that will uh, invade all the world. So, next please. So, this newcomer, <laughs> we we found uh, found ourselves uh, before this uh, this uh, problem uh, more than a year ago, and this newcomer was. SARS also 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 uh, know that it it, it is also uh, coronavirus like SARS and it is very close and for for today we have globally more than uh, one million thirty two confirmed 
million, uh, millions uh, con con confirmed cases of COVID-19. And those people who, mm, th there were talks that, oh, no, no it's not, not the case. It will, uh, it will finish very soon. And uh, it is like a seasonal influenza. Next slide, please. Um, uh, to com no 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 uh -huh. uh, to compare with this seasonal influence so we can we can say that this uh, this problem is much bigger because uh annual mortality burden of influenza to be 2050 to 5000 uh, 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 5000 uh, 500 000, 000, i'm sorry uh deaths globally and now uh, we have more than 2 million, almost 3 million deaths from COVID-19. So this is, uh, this is the case that uh, we, that teach us that uh, our global world, world is very, um, very uh, weak. And uh, we, we, turn to be unprepared for this pandemic, though we were speaking about for over, um, how, uh, over, over, over a decade. And what about solutions? Next slide, please. So, of course, uh, we, uh, we have uh, unite uh, to um, struggle to combat all these issues. And of course, uh, first of all, we have something to do with this climate crisis, climate change. Of course, we cannot uh, remove it. We cannot, uh, cannot uh, eliminate climate change. It's, it's a reality. But we have to work to, uh, to evolve, some, to develop some method methodologies to mitigate this um, this influence of course uh, we uh, the, one of the solution is uh, to improve healthcare and uh, especially healthcare health care delivery in areas of conflict and crisis uh, to address uh, dispar disparities in health equity by improving some issues were connected with the um, uh, Healthcare uh, to rise the, the access of uh, to treatments for all people uh, to prevent infectious diseases to work over disease control and uh, uh, develop new control uh, disease control programs to be prepared for epidemics and of course to uh, to to get some uh, lessons from uh, the current epidemics uh, to combat with uh, health to combat health. Risk Risks, uh, risks related to unsafe foods, to uh, to combat a, a shortage of, of health workers around the world because a low pace. So uh, there are uh, a need of uh, for investments into this field. Of course, improving public trust of healthcare workers, because, uh, for example, the um, uh, Ebola epidemics of uh, 2015 was uh, in a very uh, highway connected, uh, highway connected uh, with uh, the uh, untrust, uh, with, with the la lack of trust of local people in uh, Western Afri Africa to uh, Western medicine. And uh, it, was, it was the problem. Of course, technological advance, uh, advancements, uh, threat of antimicrobial resistance and other medicines and so on and so forth. And of course, healthcare sanitation. So this is the issues that could be uh, taken in, into account uh, to, uh, uh, by those who work in the field of uh, global healthcare, uh, disease control, uh, environment uh, environment control and uh, environment protection so that's uh, uh, what i wanted to say in this short communication so if you have any questions you may have thank you very much uh, Barbara, thank you so much for your interesting uh, presentation and uh, speech. And I think that we, uh, everyone who will trust uh, in, uh, realize that in uh, realization of all 12 points of, <laughs> of your small last slides. So, and um, we should uh, move faster. And um, I, uh, 
I would like to invite our next speakers to Um, to uh, to speak about other uh, consequences uh, uh, connected with uh, COVID-19 and lockdown. Uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Zinaida Mkhelian and, and uh, Anna Komleva. Okay, uh, hello everyone. We are happy to see you all today. And uh, my colleague Anna Kombleva and uh, I um, would like to speak about pandemia and how it uh, it's influenced uh, our lifestyle. So how it all started. Uh, tens of thousands of infected people, complete isolation, modular uh, hospitals, doctors exhausted from the load. But this uh, uh, at the turn out was only the beginning. Very soon it became clear that we were talking about uh, a global pandemic. The infection began uh, to spread rapidly outside of China. At uh, an emergency meeting called at, uh, at the request of the general director of the World Health Organization, uh, the WHO profile committee declared an emergency of international uh, importance. Uh, so from its earliest days, uh, the UN has the, uh, has led global health efforts to provide vital humanitarian assistance to the most vulnerable population. So the UN has mobilized uh, financial resources to fight COVID-19. So of uh, $1.74 billion needed for health measures in 2020 and $1.44 billion was received by the end of the summer. So it's no secret that the pandemic has left a lot of consequences, such as risk of uh, inflation, the strengthening of the state, the surveillance of uh, citizens and domestic violence, which we want to tell you about more today. Uh, quarantine measures and isolation not only led to new problems, but also exacerbated those that existed. In particular, cases of domestic violence have increased, which of course primarily affects women and children. And uh, as you can see on the slide, you um, can see the quotations of uh, uh, Irina Kasterina and uh, Andrew Bell about um, domestic um, violence. And so the problem of violence against women has become so widespread that the UN has called it a shadow of pandemic from the central um, from the Central Emergency Response Fund, it was decided to allocate $25 million to support women's organizations that fight this phenomenon and help victims. So all experts uh, attribute the outbreak uh, to the conditions of self-isolation and the economic crisis. Families are um, locked in the four walls uh, with each other. Uncertainty and stress have become more. In such a situation, conflicts are most uh, almost uh, inevitable, even in well of families. Uh, so let's uh, alone those where episodes of uh, domestic violence have already happened or have become the norm. Can I protect myself what should a woman do if she is at risk of domestic violence and how can you help your neighbor if you hear that your partner is hitting her civil society organizations in russia have reported an increase in the number of cases of domestic violence during the covid 19 pandemic on a personal level, the pandemic has often exacerbated many of the factors that can lead to domestic violence, such as stress, economic anxiety, or social isolation. In early April, April, UN General Secretary said that many women in strict isolation due to COVID-19 faced violence they would could, uh, they should be safe in their own homes. So uh, according to non-profit organizations, Russia is no exception. Uh, the Consortium of uh, Women's uh, Non-Governmental Organization uh, reported that the number of requests uh, for help in uh, the central federal districts, including Moscow uh, in May 2020, uh, doubled compared to the average uh, for the month. Uh, the Sisters Center, which provides crisis counseling by phone or email, also recorded a twofold increase 
increase in referrals in April and May 2020 compared to the same period in uh, 2019. Uh, the You Are uh, Not Alone project uh, reported that uh, reported uh, 1,352 requests uh, for help in April 2020 and 2,032. Eight uh, requests in May. Uh, at the same time, uh, the average number uh, of requests per month is um, near so 500 to 700. So the main question is why did the quarantine make the violence worse? The answer is because of the self-isolation regime. It was more difficult for victims of domestic violence to get help. For example, go to police, find a shelter, or just simple, even just leave the home. Uh, since March uh, 27, the Ministry of Internal Affairs has suspended the personal reception of citizens and recommended to contact the police through a special service on the official website. Unfortunately, Russia doesn't have his uh, have legislation legislation to deter domestic violence, and there are no protective orders in force in most of Council of Europe countries um, that protect victims who they find themselves in such situations. So, and uh, the social isolation measures necessitated by the COVID-19 pandemic are making it more difficult for those who are at risk of abuse or violence uh, to safely reach out for help. Signal for help is a simple one-handed sign someone can use uh, on a video call. It can help a person uh, silently show that, uh, they, that they need help and want uh, someone to check in with uh, them in a safe way. If you uh, see someone use the signal for help, uh, check in with the person uh, safely to find out uh, what they need and what you to do. And if you or someone you know is an immediate danger, call 911 or your local emergency services like police, fire, and ambulance. So uh, that's it, what we would like to tell you. Thank you for your attention. And if, if you have any questions, we will do our best to answer. Uh, thank you for your uh, great uh, uh, presentation. And I think that it's uh, more than new information for uh, everyone. And um, I have only one question. Did you ever use uh, that uh, numbers? Uh, no. <laughs> no, fortunately, no. <laughs> now maybe you can you recommend someone. Why did you um, uh, decide to speak about? Uh, because we think that it's uh, very important nowadays uh, and uh, I think that every people should know uh, how they can um, help uh, someone or even uh, for them uh, in such situations. That's why yes, we okay. choose this. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, it's really useful and unknown information. So um, we have no other question, and uh, we will uh, continue. Thank you, and have mm -hmm. a good day. And um, there had been a, an increase in um, investment market to mental health before pandemic uh, started, and uh, how it, um, this market has uh, changed uh, since uh, that time. Our speakers, uh, Victoria Bladnikova, will tell us. Victoria, welcome. Yes, hello everyone. And my topic sounds like uh, that: the rise of venture capital investing in mental health startups. Uh, next slide, please. My first part is dedicated to the question, why is it actually important nowadays to raise awareness around mental health issues? Actually, yes, there has been increasing acknowledgement of the important role mental health plays nowadays in achieving global development goals, as illustrated by the inclusion of mental health in the SDGs. Actually, the statistics are quite depressing. 19, 970 million people worldwide have a mental health disorder. A lot of people suffer from everyday stress and anxiety, a very common phenomenon for the 21st century. Depression with two 
164 million people suffer and it is one of the main causes of disability. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among teenagers. People with mental health conditions die prematurely as much as two decades early. And as for students, a quarter of them have different mental disorders, but only 13% of students receive proper treatment such as on-campus counseling. And these numbers actually could worsen as people around the world adjust to new reality during the pandemic that has affected the mental state of 59% of people worldwide. And moreover, despite progress in some countries, people with these kind of conditions often experience human rights violation, discrimination, and neglection. And dismantling the stigma around mental illnesses is important nowadays more than ever. Next slide. Simultaneously with the wave of awareness of the importance of mental health, a completely new problem has emerged, romanticization of mental illnesses. Pop culture has created a normally positive image for things that should not be seen as something good and actually very dangerous to health like depression, bipolar disorder, panic attacks, schizophrenia, anorexia, bulimia, alcohol use, and drug use. At some points, mental illnesses suddenly began to appear beautiful, fascinating, and you would be lying if you said that you had never seen aesthetic pictures with depressing quotes or excerpts from movies. Besides, we see complete disinformation and lack of mental health education at schools and universities. Even though society has changed its attitude, the topic still remains taboo. And a few parents simply explain to children why depression is dangerous. So affected by media, children may want to stand out from the crowd and they want to be not like everyone else. And they just feel lonesome among peers and this can lead to self-destructive behavior. Here I would like to mention one real case um, immediately after the release of Netflix series Certain Reasons Why, which tells about a girl who committed a suicide. The number of suicides among teenagers has increased dramatically in the United States, uh, according to the National Institute of Health. In April 2017, the number of suicides among teenagers increased by 29% and reached the highest in five years. Here we can also speak about so-called Werther effect, a phenomenon when people tend to copy behavior that is widely highlighted in the media, whether healthy or destructive. Copycat suicide is an example of one of its most extreme cases. All in all, here I would like to mention that the problem is of great significance and if taking care of mental health becomes as fashionable as, for example, physical health, the world would definitely become a better place. So nowadays, mental health startups are actually tackling this sector's complexities because investors go all in. While people have previously suffered from anxiety, lifestyle disorders, depression, insomnia, work-related stress, um, the pandemic has only brought these issues to the surface. With work from home and self-isolation and it's at its peak, the need for mental health is more evident than ever. Fortunately, businesses do not remain on the sidelines. Mental health startups are looking to address this issue by intervention. The niche is actually quite empty and investors are jumping on board because the market is large and it can handle the competition. Yet the startups are not only capitalizing on the opportunity uh, by intervening when people most need this help, but also have found revenue and user growth uh, to establish themselves uh, in the market. Many industry experts also believe that the demand, uh, the demand for these kind of services is only going to increase uh, due to this uncertainty caused by uh, COVID-19. Another argument in favor of the startups is the anonymity offered by online counseling uh, that creates a safer space for people who uh, may face stigma when they receive the similar help 
in physical clinics. And actually, there used to be very little dedicated capital for early stage mental health startups. However, uh, many of the funds have grown in scale in recent years. And for example, um, during that time, investors only in the United States pumped nearly $2.6 billion into these sort of companies. Um, and in already in 2021, investors have made in investments uh, uh, worth of $328. Next slide. By early 2020, 717 mental health startups had been formed and there is a kind of an ecosystem, as you see on the slide. There are mental wellness, when mental wellness applications, uh, apps for sleep, medication, uh, breathing exercises, educational tools, um, B2B tools uh, that are used for corporate mental health programs, measurements and testings. They provide different trackings of mood, or other subjective parameters, uh, telehealth. Uh, this is about remote engagement and interaction with clinicians. Non-tech and others, these are brick and mortar treatment centers with their apps or just anything that isn't primarily a technology-based technology uh, business. Digital therapeutics, uh, resources used in conjunction with medication or behavioral interactions. And peer-to-peer, -peer, these are the sources to fight isolation. The sources bring people together and create a kind of a community for the purpose of well-being. And on the right um, part of the slide, you see top five mental health startups that uh, really impact the industry. For example, Clarigent Health is an um, artificial intelligence based platform that can detect mental health conditions and it acts as a clinical decision support providing medical staff with insights into mental health issues. Seven Cops is a virtual therapy app. The counselors help individuals 24 slash seven on anonymous basis and the uh, people are introduced uh, with different techniques, meditations, breathing exercises. Mood Path is a mood tracking service. The app generates even an electronic document with the results that can be used for consultation with a healthcare professional. Meditopia is a meditation app that can help you to reduce stress and sleep well. It offers personalized programs with music and bedtime stories. And Feel is an emotion sensing wristband together with an app that provides real time monitoring um, and personalized interventions for individuals uh, to help fight anxiety and depression and to help them manage emotion. So, what is next? Uh, an unexpected side effect of uh, COVID 19 is actually an unprecedented opportunity in mental health here. The question is no longer whether technology will transform it, but when and how it will occur. The first opportunity is, of course, to meet patients where they are, engage pe people with treatment by going directly to them. Um, to improve population health, we need an online stepped care system in which individuals uh, will be members instead of patients and they will be offered a selection of uh, evidence-based interventions. Uh, should the need arise, they can, there can be an easily transition to traditional individual or group therapy. There has also been a dramatic increase in the number of bloggers and influencers in social media that raise awareness and spread positive affirmations to help people relax and fight anxiety. Uh, corporate demand for mental health services has surged as well. The pandemic had led to more conversations about 
uh, the actions towards better mental health in uh, big companies. So in a way, COVID-19 has made mental health pretty trendy. But all in all, companies must earn the public's trust. Uh, they must confront a culture that fundamentally encourages rapid growth to meet investors' expectations. So reconciling uh, the move fast and break things mentality of startups with the cautious and rigorous approach of medicine will take conscious effort and discipline. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. Varvara, do you have a question? Yes, yes, I, I have a small question. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. But uh, you said that pandemic has only brought the mental issues to the surface. But did you uh, did you take into consideration the problem that is widely discussed now that um, about the deterioration of mental health uh, among people who survived? COVID, who contracted COVID and uh, had, had uh, this illness, and now uh, they suffer from uh, so-called uh, post-COVID syndrome. So, and uh, to, to, to my, uh, I, I feel that uh, this may uh, slightly change the, uh, the picture, the full picture now. So what do you think about it? Uh... Actually, I haven't heard of post-COVID syndrome. If you can give me some insights of what it is, maybe I will provide you with an answer. Okay, so uh, I think that uh, it's, it's a long talk, so um, I just just uh, address you to some publications, and uh, I, I think that you will you will okay, find I will, something interesting for you. I will do the research. Varvara, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, it's uh, really interesting uh, new disease. It was, uh, I think, uh, on uh, April uh, 20, uh, last year, on April, it was uh, firstly published that information, and uh, it's uh, really a dramatic situation uh, with uh, such kind of uh, patient, but I think that it's uh, another in another task and another speech and um, but uh, I think is that uh, it will be interesting uh, for you uh, Victoria to uh, revise that information okay and um, thank you and um, our uh, our um, Next uh, speakers will continue uh, to know the topic of uh, mental health and the focus on the aspect of uh, mental health uh, crisis of employers. You're welcome. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Sophia, and together with uh, my colleague Kira, we would like to talk about uh, the issue of employment or well-being in the post-COVID times. And according to the mental health experts, coronavirus outbreak and all the stress factors related to it, which the previous speaker also mentioned, can lead to the global mental health crisis and cause or exacerbate mental health challenges in the workplace. And the goal of our today's presentation is to discuss how enterprises can minimize the adverse effect of the new mental pandemic. So next slide, please. In the modern world, stress is ranked as one of the main issues that put human health under the threat. In 2016, according to the World Health Organization, every third worker in Russia experienced severe stress at least once a week, and 13% almost every day. The situation abroad at that time was also depressing. For example, in the United States, more than 90% of workers admitted that their psychological state was determined by the result of work but not other factors. Overall, the percentage of employees experiencing mental problems in Russia was slightly higher than in Western Europe. The consequences of stress can be very dangerous. Many suffer from chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, which is accompanied by insomnia, conflicts, weakness in the morning, pain in the eyes, frequent headaches, and the tendency to loneliness and depression. Exposure to stress at work leads to the development of cardiovascular diseases, 
diseases of the nervous system and diseases of the reproductive system. We also want to point out that the death rate in the workplace usually exceeds the fatal injury rate in the production process. Next slide, please. Yeah, and due to the pandemic, the situation with uh, mental health uh, among people has become much worse. Coronavirus outbreak affected the mental well-being of a great number of people and sparked or amplified much more serious mental health disorders, which can last in the longer term, according to the experts. In addition to the stress factors that workers already faced at work, uh, which Kira has mentioned. During pandemic, there appeared such stress factors as the fear of being infected, for example, and uh, concerns about the relative's health and even um, suffering from uh, losses of the loved ones. Uh, and other, um, other, uh, there are also other stress factors, which you can see in this slide. And most of them are very traumatic for the people, which inev inevitably takes its toll on the workers' mental well-being. Thus, according to the research of RBC, um, Russian workers reported to have such feelings as, for example, psychological resistance, constant strain, exhaustion, and etc. And uh, we also wanted to say that uh, apart from the stress factors of the pandemic, which are listed here, uh, we can say that uh, COVID uh, coronavirus uh, can, um, can also be the reason for the de deterioration of uh, the mental health, uh, of the mental health, because uh, as, as I know that uh, coronavirus uh, affects the nervous system uh, in um, gravely and uh, it can lead to um, the re real deterioration of the mental health of the people who, who suffered from uh, COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. According to Hayes, a quarter of companies uh, now do nothing to help the workers cope, to cope with stress and other mental health problems. Though some companies do introduce some measures in order to help employees deal with their mental health issues, in general, this situation doesn't get enough attention among employees, which it really deserves. Uh, so what are the reasons for that? First of all, uh, it may, may be difficult for HR, man HR managers and line managers to identify the workers who need help. They can be, um, the workers can be unwilling to reveal their mental health problems because of, for example, um, being afraid of uh, being fired or discriminated at work, they reveal that, uh, or just um, because they are unwilling to discuss their own problems with others, or they just uh, un uh, they, they are just unaware of their own poor mental health condition. Uh, moreover, employees may ignore the problem because they don't want to intrude on workers' privacy, or they suppose uh, that workers should deal with such problems themselves, or they are unwilling to invest money. Uh, they they think that it is. Um, uh, it is not necessary or, uh, yeah. And uh, this can have grave consequences for the company's uh, financial results because employees who suffer from poor mental health have low levels of engagement and uh, increased absenteeism and low productivity. Uh, and, uh, for example, the World Health Organization uh, has estimated that depression and anxiety alone cost the global economy $1 trillion per year in lost productivity. And uh, this number is predicted to become $60 trillion uh, just over the next, uh, just over uh, 20 years. So next slide, please. Continuing our talk, let's switch to the analysis of specific pandemic environment and measures taken to prevent mental health problems. We cannot ignore, for example, that due to the pandemic, two thirds of work processes have switched to a remote work format 
while only one third of them are reserved for personal meetings. This leads to qualitative changes in the relationships between employees. Now, in order to support the mental health of everybody, it is essential to be empathetic when a colleague on the other side of the world is distracted by children or a pet. Self-control and responsibility are also required for employees who work from home. Moreover, online communication quality becomes critical to maintaining the efficiency of processes while the office environment is losing its relevance as a place of negotiation. Many companies in Russia have introduced antiviral implementation teams in order to reduce stress caused by unexpected changes and fear of the future. Such teams are responsible for monitoring the situation and providing, pre and providing preventive measures to the virus. Other measures to support employees' mental health include some sports programs, for example, fitness and yoga, medical and psychological consultations, opportunities to work from the countryside or another city with better climate conditions. Usually such measures are combined into complex mental health programs, which are quite widespread at the moment among organizations. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and uh, as for the recommendations, um, what measures can be taken by Russian companies to address the to address the mental health impact of the coronavirus pandemic on workers, uh, we can say that uh, there should be a systematic and holistic approach, uh, taking into account the Russian mentality instead of uh, borrowing separate solutions such as yoga classes that just because they worked abroad, because uh, we can see uh, this happening in uh, some of our, some of the Russian companies that they just borrow these ideas and do not uh, take into account our Russian mentality. Employees' mental well-being should become one of the main areas of the company's strategy and be embedded into the organizational culture. Therefore, it makes sense for HRs to introduce and fix new principles of work, such as result over process, empathy, empathy over authority, high level of trust, involvement at a distance uh, if the workers are working remotely, and flexibility of the remote teams. Also, the atmosphere, atmosphere of an open dialogue should be created where people aren't afraid to talk about their feelings and do not keep things bottled up inside. In addition, employers should also introduce psychological education events, for example, regular mental health days in order to educate line managers and workers in dealing with mental health problems, in order to reduce stigma connected with these problems and to explain that asking specialists for help is not something shameful. Next slide, please. Concluding the presentation, work-related stresses existed even before the pandemic, but not all companies were interested in dealing with them, believing that the costs of maintaining mental health were not justified. However, during the pandemic, the problem of employee well-being escalated so much that most companies accelerated the implementation of programs to maintain uh, mental health of employees. The typical methods of dealing with stress in Russia before the pandemic were rather scarce, which is why there is a need to update and popularize various methods of maintaining mental health. Until now, not all companies see the point in introducing complex mental health programs, although the effectiveness of such solutions is high. Finally, McKinsey experts believe that changing the corporate environment and approach to organizing business processes is a chance for enterprises to free themselves from the inertia of the past and get rid of questionable habits and systems. In addition, it notes that with a well-planned return to the offices, employees will rethink their roles in the team and can create a more fertile ground for developing talent strengthening collaboration, increasing productivity, and reducing costs. Therefore, any problem area can become the basis for new opportunities. And that's the last idea we wanted to share with you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your so interesting uh, uh, presentation. And we have a question. Um, Varvara, you first. 
Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, for um, uh, I would, uh, so you were speaking about uh, providing uh, among uh, the measures and uh, solutions. Uh, you were speaking about providing mental, medical, and uh, psych psychological advice for uh, mm -hmm. employees. But uh, do you have any numbers? Uh, how many? I don't speak qualified, but how many psychologists? Um, with diplomas and li li licensed psychologists we have in our countries don't you don't you have do you have a feeling that uh, uh, we have a sufficient number of, of uh, such people who can deal with the uh, post covid problems and who can who can provide uh, quali uh, qualified uh, advice and uh, support um, thank you for your question. Uh, actually, I believe that, um, actually, I agree, agree that um, maybe we don't have enough uh, qualified specialists in this field in Russia today. Uh, but that was uh, only one of the measures that can be taken. And we also uh, mentioned that um, if uh, the um, the assistance of the specialist uh, specialist is uh, can be introduced in the company. Then maybe it is um, um, it is a good idea to just uh, start with uh, talking to the people and trying to um, create the atmosphere of uh, trust and understanding, and maybe the. Um, the the prof professional help will not be necessary for them. Just to 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 make them feel that um, their their problems um, are uh, important for the company, that uh, the company cares about them. So maybe that's the the um, the solution. Thank you very much. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one more question uh, from our chat. How does online uh, counseling first uh, in uh, contrast to offline face-to-face -face meetings? What do you think? Um, well, I can try to answer this question. Well, uh, the, the online communication has several um, options. For example, you cannot control what is happening on the other side of the screen. Uh, you uh, cannot uh, give your hand of help to another person. You can just talk and maybe uh, sometimes see another person. Uh, but a lot of other um, channels of um, communicating and of... For example, body, body language. Body language, yeah. Uh, you cannot analyze it clearly. That's why um, many people can be confused. Thank you for your answer. I totally agree with you. And uh, we uh, continue our discussion. Thank you. Thank you. We, we have heard about uh, cyber, uh, we have heard about the uh, sub organization uh, it's a difficult word for me today. Uh, as a new trend in modern technologies. Uh, so uh, let's listen uh, to some ethical and economic issue uh, connected with it. And uh, let me introduce our uh, speaker, Ivan Dukvichev. You're welcome. Hello, can you hear me? Is yes. the volume all right? So good afternoon to all participants of the conference. I'm Ivan, <clears throat> a second year student at IBS Runepa. I'll touch upon the topic of cyborgization, its development, its ethical and economic concerns and future prospects. It's quite an expensive topic, so I hope that I'll be able to give you the main trends of its development. Firstly, to understand the meaning behind cyborgization, we must learn the history of the creation of the idea of it. It's not a secret for anyone that for an extensive period of time, people regarded cyborgization or body augmentation of men 
as a sci-fi flick plot point. Indeed, uh, the problem of human identity being replaced by a machine appears in literature as early as the late 1830s in an Edgar Poe story, The Man That Was Used Up, where a war veteran struggles with having his body made up entirely of prosthetics. A hundred years later, the topic of cyborgization becomes one of the main conflicts in postmodernist fiction, being played straight in superhero comics about DC's Cyborg, Star Wars, Darth Vader, and many others. Yet a man's yearning for the enhancement of his body predates the age of technology. For the entirety of human race, people wish to become a higher being, to become as gods. Such motives were the root of many myths, such as the tale of Icarus, for example, who made himself a pair of wings to fly to the god. The path to become a superhuman was the goal of many different religions, like Buddhism and Zoroastrianism. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, a German philosopher, described superhuman as a being that will take the place of the god. Uh, in the recent years, there have been a lot of modifications of the human body. Uh, starting with biology and chemistry, we managed to perform surgery to replace faulty organs uh, and take medicine to cure diseases. Yet only in the latter half of the 20th century, with the rise of genetics, at nanotechnology, it became possible not only to replace, but to also enhance genetically modified human parts or install even non-biological ones, which were not previously present in the body. As such, the classification of human cyborgization can be divided into three levels. First is replacing faulty parts with uh, the same one, which is authentic replacement, replacing them with superior ones or adding new parts to expand body's capabilities, which is additional inclusion. This presents the main ethical concern of whether this person's psyche is affected and whether or not a person with cybernetic enhancement can be considered uh, a human, a real human. Next slide. Uh, perhaps the main concerns which come with cybernetic enhancements are whether they answer safety regulations and whether they are accessible to the wider demographic. First is the safety issues. They consider whether the operation are reversible or permanent and whether it will have an effect on humans' mental capabilities. Um, generally, such operations as laser-based eye surgery or implantation of crystalline lens, which enhance the vision of a person, limbs, transpl transplantation of non-vital organs, are considered safe, while operations with neural altering machi machinery, such as the brain-computer interface or direct neural interface, which were developed in 1970s in the University of Columbia in Los Angeles, as far as I remember, connected directly to brain's neural system and are made to enhance analytical capabilities of the brain and connected to a larger network of autonomous devices. And another main concern is availability, which is directly linked to the cost of production of implants and its affordability to lower and middle classes of citizens. Uh, due to impossibility of mass production, the cost of implants is estimated in hundreds of thousands of dollars, which makes it completely unavailable to, generous popu to general population. And the same processes could be seen even today on a smaller level uh, in the fields of dental care and cosmetic surgery, which are available only to the wealthy. Uh, another three concerns are less common and less important, but nonetheless they exist, such as the maintenance concerns, which are steeped in the lack of necessary material skills and qualifications to easily perform a maintenance of a highly sophisticated uh, technological equipment. Uh, furthermore, maintenance may severely damage the brain tissue and cause mental disabilities, which also presents the concern of safety. The second one is privacy, personal privacy concerns, which is by implanting nanochips inside of, the, of our organism, our brains, it's potentially possible to disclose vital information about our body the level of metabolism, stress, and other parameters. 
and via hormonal injections it's possible to control emotional and physical reaction of the body in, in a given situation. And the last one is justice concerns, <clears throat> which means that with the appearance of people with enhanced physical capabilities, it would lead to further segregation of society with a preference in job opportunities, sports and education being given to transhumans. Uh, those concerns only become apparent as soon as the technological, uh, as soon as the technology becomes commonplace. But at this point in time, we have already existing problems concerning uh, economic opportunities. Uh, due to the <clears throat> industries of nanotechnology and genetic engineering being rapidly developing areas, it's important to act accurately predict and take advantage of the stages of its implementation. Uh, according to a wide assortment of clinical professionals and physicists, as well as the Russian philosopher and transhumanist Leonid Grinin in his work, Dynamics of Technological Growth Rate and the Forecoming Singularity, uh, he says that the rate of development of technology is divided into three main parts, which is the starting phase, uh, which encompasses creation and development of electronic calculation devices, the middle phase, which is characterized by the creation of global network of electronic devices, and the final phase, which, which creates a self-sustained cybernetic systems, which are able to function without the input of humans. So which main trends can we see from those phases, which are common in, in all three of them? Uh, those are the reduction of human input, information and analysis control, operational space reduction, meaning the ability to work with a much less uh, data, mm. corporativism and impossibility of reverse engineering, in, engineering which makes fail-proof solutions to those problems impossible. Uh, the workforce is also expected to change drastically with the growth in human life expectancy is likely that more than 70% of workers will be 40 or higher. Uh, though the productivity is expected to also increase with the boost in analytical uh, and physical capabilities of a human body. So the main focus of venture capital capitalists today, as I think should be on implementing AI programs in production of goods and services, uh, data and information analysis and investment into nanotechnology research. Uh, it's expected that cyborgization will aid in streamlining supply chains and means of production, as well as creating and taking over previous industries with needs for precise analysis, such as aerodynamics, for example, meteorology, astrology, physics, uh, and others. So to conclude, while suburbization presents prospective job and business opportunities, it also affects all aspects of our social structure from education to work, medical care and sport. While we can alleviate some biological and economical issues of our current society, it creates a plethora of ethical concerns for which there doesn't exist a singular solution. And as such, the research on human cyborgization is still in its infant stage. So it's impossible to fully predict the consequences of its implementation and development. I believe that's all for me. I will be happy to answer all of your questions if they uh, arrive. Uh, Ivan, thank you for your great presentation. And it's uh, really interesting. And. Um, um, I have one question. Uh, what kind of um, devices uh, uh, maybe you, you uh, would like to implement if uh, it will be possible? Well, for me, the question is not whether cyborgization will happen, but when it will happen. I believe there are already a lot of different researches that are being made on this topic. I believe that for me, the muscle, the muscle augmentation would be the most proficient. It would help in medicine and in sport, and as well as the coordination of human bodies. So I believe that would be the most promising research made into this topic.
Thank you for your great speech. And uh, uh, we know that uh, only 13% uh, percent of the uh, personal health uh, um, depends on the uh, quantity of the uh, health care system. And uh, more than 50% percent, uh, depend on personal lifestyle. So, um, uh let me uh give uh, a rules as a moderator to maria belikova and uh, uh i with, with great pleasure i will ask maria to yes Natalia, thank you so much uh so i also like to um to welcome all of you to our second part. We will be talking about sport and medicine all together because we're a faculty of uh, sport management and tourism management. And I'm not alone uh, today with you. Uh, so I have uh, nowadays three experts here. Uh, so first of all, I would like to uh, present uh, Sir Kirill Masliv. He's one of the best uh, professors, yes, uh, from our faculty, and uh, he's a big expert in anti age medicine, in uh, prevention medicine, and etc. Uh, also, uh, today with me and with you also will be uh, Michael Lang. He's um, an expert. Uh, also in um, construction and flat sports, and of course, uh, Olga Gavrilina, uh, well known also our associate professor, and uh, we will be uh, an expert uh, today for you, and of course, our students, uh, we will have a mix today with our uh, international business school students and uh, also our students uh, from international finance um, um, and uh, we will have a big I think uh, cooperation here and with the great results so as a moderator I would like to to talk about some um, system problems that we have in our um, international sport activity. Uh, I think that you know all of you that uh, Russia is systematically and constantly squeezed out of the international sp sports movement. Uh, in 2020 year, uh, in the court of arbitration for a sport, uh, has banned all Russian officials from holding senior positions in any international um, sport organizations and federations. So um, we know that um, it can, of course, influence uh, to all the uh, decisions nowadays in sport activities. And of course, the complex um, impact on Russia uh, within the framework of the global uh, confrontation in the field of sports is a long game. And of course, we should now think about what we can do uh, for um, giving our uh, talented athletes a uh, new chance, a uh, new chance to be in Olympic movement and what can we do. Uh, so we should somehow um, give them the perspectives, and that is uh, the main idea for us. Um, so, of course, uh, demographic reputation, image, and direct losses uh, with, will amount to hundreds of millions of euros. And, of course, uh, as a scientific movement, as a faculty, we should do something, uh, and if I hope that we will give some decisions here uh, what we can do. Um, so another point, uh, what problems we have uh, if we sum up, uh, because we're, uh, we have not so many time today. Uh, so the first problem is the lack of uh, Russian thoughts in the world sports bureaucracy. 
it's the first uh, point that in which we should work. Uh, the second problem is the lack of Russian knowledge in the international scientific movement. That is why we should uh, work hard, make some articles, make some scientific work for uh, having our uh, goals for uh, our thoughts also. Uh, the third one is not true information about Russian sport, sport activities and sport events. And of course, the COVID influence to sport events that we have nowadays. And one of our themes will be about this. Uh, also, of course, uh, we should understand that sport activities and uh, medicine, future medicine, it's um, very close nowadays. And uh, when we're talking about the Olympic movement, if we're talking about the results of our athletes, uh, not only Russian athletes, but all over the world, we should think also about the uh, future medicine and what we can do here and what are the main trends. Uh, we should know this and um, these trends will influence the whole sport industry. I think so. So the, mm, this um, idea, I think, can spread the our associate professor Kirill Maslif. So welcome to our student Gaidar. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Maria, uh, so much. And uh, I would like to thank uh, everybody for invitation to such a significant forum. And I hope that it will be very useful and that it will be a very interesting discussion. So if it's possible to characterize our life in some uh, way, the first thing that comes to my mind is the word speed, the incredible pace of life, even despite the pandemic. With the development of technology, uh, it has become possible to implement many projects remotely. The direction of the same distance medicine no longer seems like something futuristic. If 10 years ago it was just uh, communication via Skype, then the number of technological tools that are actively introduced into our life allow us to register a large amount of data on the go and immediately send it to our doctor. The speed of internet, gadgets, software, portability of medical devices, uh, give a real life to such a direction as telemedicine. But in addition to all innovative developments, the most important thing is that the entire vector of healthcare will one way or another way um, be aimed to, uh, at the development of, of uh, personalized medicine. The development of such areas as genetics, metabolomics, the study of microbiome, um, it, all these technologies make uh, uh, possible to, um, to do a personalized medicine and not only to more accurately diagnose disease, but also to build a whole strategy for the prevention, including an individual selection of nutrition, nutrients, and most importantly, drugs. By the way, uh, according to WHO, errors or incorrectly selected medicine cause complications and death in 1.3 million people annually. Having data on the individual characteristics of the organism, it's possible to select not only an effective and safe drug, but also your own dosage. And the next slide, the next slide, please. And the next one, please. Yeah, thank you. I believe that in the near future, there will be a, such a specialty as health manager. In fact, when we doctors analyze a patient health, we no longer in, uh, have enough knowledge in any narrow specialty. For example, even the stage of recovery after fracture requires a doctor knowledge not only in traumatology and orthopedics, but also in endocrinology, physiotherapy, nutrition, and so on. 
Another example uh, is the coronavirus. Understanding the consequence of its effect on the human body, absolutely unexpectedly, not only pulmonologists, but also rheumatologists, cardiologists, uh, oncologists, and even parasitologists became important in demand. The list of drugs that have shown their effectiveness includes hormonal drugs that have been used for many years to treat various disease, uh, immunosuppressants used uh, in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, antiplatelet agents like Lexan, antiparasitic agents, and so on. The interconnection of all processes occurring in our body requires a multidisciplinary approach and curator, a health manager who, like a conductor, will unite specialists from different fields of medicine uh, and develop a unique personal program for the treatment and prevention of disease. Of course, we expect uh, a breakthrough in the treatment of the most dangerous disease, cardiovascular, oncological, and so on. We have learned uh, to extend lifespan. There has been an incredible increase in life expectancy over the past 200 years. Technologies that made it possible to achieve such a significant changes, early diagnosis and prevention of chronic diseases, the invention of antibiotics and vaccines, hygiene. Scientific and technology project progress and the benefits of civilization have led to a real increase in life expectancy, but on the other hand, they have formed a population of 10 million people over 65 years old with many chronic disease. For example, only in uh, USA alone, uh, there were more than 5 million patients with Alzheimer's disease, more than 6 million patients with cardiovascular disease, more than 2 million patients with osteoporosis. According to various data, we expected uh, an increase of life expectancy in the next 10 years to 16%, from 5.9 to 6.2 additional years. In the next 30 years, by 2050, we expected 20 years more of life. Uh, after all, the task of medicine is precisely to prevent the occurrence of disease, to preserve an active, healthy life of society for as long as possible. Thank you, everybody, for your knowledge, diligence, Future world, you know, scientists, a uh, really big breakthrough in the medicine of the future awaits us. We really hope for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kirill Sergeyevich. Um, so um, we now will uh, have also one more expert. Um, I think that uh, nowadays uh, we should not only speak about the medicine, about uh, sport, but also how sport industry um, nowadays um, changing, and uh, it's uh, it's the main process nowadays because um, I think that we have changes in different spheres, and one of these spheres it's how uh, the construction of flat sports facilities also. Uh, we have nowadays, and of course, if if we um, in memory find out the information, uh, what was uh, the sport facilities and how we can find out main uh, peculiarities nowadays, you will see the great differences. So I would like to present Michael Lam. Uh, so please welcome. Good afternoon, uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Um, uh, today uh, I would like to pay attention to uh, construction of sports facilities in Russia in 2020 and 2021, and also influence of COVID-19 for uh, construction industry and also sports industry. Uh, uh, sales, uh, wholesale, uh, as everything is linked together. Uh, Briefly, uh, we would uh, go on different topics. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, uh, uh, briefly on construction of sport facilities, on government programs, construction of private sport facilities, uh, imp 
how was the influence for professional and amateur clubs and for sports, wholesale and retail? If uh, we would be uh, looking on construction of sports facilities on uh, government programs, I would like to say that uh, last year, uh, due to uh, uh, pandemic started uh, in spring, there was a delay in start of construction on many projects. And also, it caused a delay in completion of projects uh, because of a few time left uh, by the end of the year and uh, due to the weather conditions we have in Russia. Uh, allocated budgets for 2020 by government uh, were not cut and uh, uh, most of companies and uh, local governments, uh, ministers of sports had to uh, face a challenge uh, uh, to spend their money that uh, they were having uh, for 2020. Uh, there were se uh, several issues that uh, were having impact uh, for construction for, and for companies involved in construction. Uh, there was a significant uh, cross rate race uh, for import uh, materials used for construction. Uh, and uh, due to this, uh, there, uh, there were lower margins uh, and profits. Uh, uh, for companies involved in import of uh, materials uh, and also uh, when budgets were fixed uh, for in prices, it caused uh, a lowering of quality uh, on some materials because uh, uh, contractors has to use uh, cheaper materials in order to stay on the same uh, price level and cost level. One of the uh, very significant uh, impacts uh, for construction industry was a shortage of workforce uh, due to closed borders. Uh, usually, uh, there are lots of um, uh, foreign uh, workforce comes in Russia from Middle Asia and uh, for special works uh, uh, from all over the world. And uh, due to this, uh, Russia was facing shortage, uh, especially uh, in on the Far East projects uh, where uh, migration for uh, construction season is quite visible. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if we look on construction of private sport facilities, the possible race of activity uh, on a residential real estate uh, market, uh, it caused it was uh, the race uh, due to the absence of possibility for many rich people to travel abroad and to visit their homes and, and uh, 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 residentials uh, abroad. So uh, many of them were buying uh, residential uh, houses outside of cities and also for their children, they were for themselves, they were, uh, they were uh, building private playgrounds and tennis courts, which was uh, very helpful for uh, middle and uh, small construction companies. Uh, if we briefly talk about professional clubs, uh, uh, which have a big uh, usual budget for uh, athletes, uh, for soccer players, uh, and uh, also uh, in other professional clubs, there was an absence of spectators, uh, lack of local competitions, and finally, short local competition season uh, uh, in second part of the year. Uh, total absence of international competitions and uh, in consequence uh, of this, there was a drop of revenues for professional clubs from ticketing and uh, TV broadcasting. Uh, for uh, amateur sport clubs, uh, there was a, an absence of possibility for activity, uh, short local competition season, uh, uh, which all, always um, uh, good, uh, comp uh, small competitions are, are very good for children, for amateurs. And uh, in order to save uh, staff uh, and to, sa to save clients, uh, there was uh, a remote activities uh, to resume with players, athletes, amateurs. And that helped uh, uh, to, uh, for clubs uh, of different levels, uh, for amateur clubs to, to, stay, uh, to stay alive uh, and not to shut down. Uh, Finally, sports wholesale uh, uh, also is a part of uh, construction industry. Uh, increase, uh, there was a significant increase in sports wholesale due uh, to the point that 
uh, there were allocated budgets for many clubs uh, for travel uh, and uh, for some, uh, competitions, and th those budgets were not spent. So by the end of the year, we faced a significant increase in wholesale for professional and amateur clubs as they had to spend their allocated budgets. And uh, for the next 2021, uh, most of budgets were undercut in comparison with 2020, uh, as the uh, situation is still uncertain uh, for local and international competitions and for travel. Uh, sports retail. Uh, uh, many shops uh, were closed uh, beginning of the year, and uh, it was a very huge drop down in sales and profits. Uh, many shops uh, were closed, uh, some of them shut down uh, and finished their business. And uh, uh, after opening, after pandemic, uh, retail uh, many retail customers uh, who lost their jobs. Uh, they were saving money for current needs and we are not spending uh, money for new sports equipment. Uh, that costs uh, uh, the amount of money uh, that is in sports business. Uh, and some issues uh, were enough for companies to stay alive. Uh, for some companies, it was negative trend uh, for activity. But finally, uh, everybody hopes that uh, everything will recover. And in 2022-2023, Everything will come back uh, to the normal side of life. I wish you good luck as well. Stay healthy and wealthy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mikhail. So uh, now we will have the second part of our session. So I uh, would like to hear our students and the experts, if you'd like to... Uh, or if you have some questions to our students, you're welcome. So please uh, don't hesitate and please um, be active if you'd like. And also students, if you'd like also to uh, ask some information uh, from our experts, you can also ri uh, write your question in chat and uh, we will have also time for this. So uh, the next um, uh, topic for today, it's uh, Sport Industry Fiasco in 2020. Uh, Zorin Ilya and Simakova Ekaterina, welcome. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am Ekaterina Simakova and with my colleague, we will present you our topic, Sport Industry Fiasco in 2020. So every sector of the sports industry, whether it's high-performance sports or sport journalism, has been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. In terms of the impact on sports, the spread of COVID-19 was the most significant event since the Second World War. For example, in the entire history of the Olympic Games have never been postponed. The crisis also revealed the need for systematic changes in sport organizations. What used to seem like a trend of the future, digitalization, AR and VR, is now a new reality. So here we are, please. Okay, uh, so the main theme is how did the, uh, previous slide please. How did the sport industry cope with the pandemic? Uh, generally, after realize, uh, realizing the seriousness of the pandemic, all the actors in the sport industry tried to find the best way out of this situation. Athletes tried to keep in shape using the space of their apartments, houses. To see the training process of famous athletes at home during the pandemic was even easier than in normal times, and athletes willingly shared their training programs in social networks. And uh, let me introduce several examples. Olympic swimming champion Sharon Van Ruvendal used a miniature children pool for training. She swam there while remaining in one place due to a special tourniquet attached uh, to the foot. And Formula One driver Roman Kroshin keep his head in a horizontal position to train the neck muscles. And uh, let me say that this helmet uh, is about uh, two kilograms in weight. So uh, coaches and employees of such sports studios like uh, world-class, like SM Stretching Russia and other recorded training 
uh, sessions and arranged live broadcasts for everyone who wanted to lead a healthy lifestyle, even in conditions of self-isolation. The organizers of competitions and sport events arranged online championship in uh, cyber sports, in cyber tennis, football, and etc. of course. So pandemic has uh, encouraged an uh, active process of sport events visualization. For example, Formula One created a virtual Grand Prix uh, where cars on the game tracks uh, were driven by real people. And also uh, the competition included uh, Lando Norris, uh, Nicholas Latifi, who is a real driver of Formula One. And uh, also, so the Russian Football Union in 2020 announced the launch of FIFA 20 Cyber Football Tournament, our guys. So next slide, please. Yeah. To what extent did the sports industry suffer? The sports industry missed out on more than $60 billion in 2020. Moreover, the projected growth rate of the sports industry for the next three, five years fell by around 3% in 2020 comparing to the year 2019, while the difference between the actual growth rates and expected one is almost 5%. Uh, next, please. Yeah. Uh, also, from the chart on the slide, you can see how well the sports industry prepared to face the pandemic. And you can see that not very well. So next slide. Yeah, moving on to the details. The pandemic has suffered the closure and bankruptcy of some private sports centers. XVL California-based works Flywheel Sports all filed for bankruptcy. The latter temporarily laid off even 98% of its employees due to the financial strain. Uh, moreover, not only many comp competitions were postponed in 2020, the greatest case, you know, was the uh, uh, transfer of the Olympic Games in Tokyo. But some, some of the competitions were completely cancelled. The Ice Hockey World Cup 2020, the Wimbledon Tennis Tournament, and many others. Also, the athletes who violated the self-isolation uh, regime suffered reputational and monetary losses. Footballer Luka Jovic, professional boxer Artur Bertirbiev were fined for violating quarantine. Tennis player Novak Djokovic has been heavily criticized, including threats and unacceptable wishes against him for violating the quarantine at the tournament he organized. Finally, athletes missed the chance to perform at the peak of their form, which affected both their psychological state and uh, their finances. Financial losses are explained by the fact that some countries pay athletes money from their state budget for, uh, for getting overs at the highest competitions, of course. For some competitions, athletes receive high, high price money, sponsorship, and advertising contracts also bring them profits. And all this was missed. Uh, for an athlete, it's not simply moving a flag in the calendar. You bring yourself to the peak of the form. You somewhere underperform. You sometimes sacrifice something, withdraw from the start where you can earn, and all this for nothing," said Nikolai Romenka, editor in chief of the newspaper Soviet Sport. He also added that for many athletes, participation in the Olympics was a dream that might never come true. Next slide, please. Okay, and what are the ways of the future development of the sport industry? Uh, we were talking about the IT and the game industry development, right? And the coronavirus pandemic is driving the development of the game industry as well. Well-known companies as BMW and Intel Core in recent years uh, began uh, actively invest in such area. And uh, the curious fact is that the people have also began to watch sports competitions uh, and also the esports competitions, uh, the most important thing. The widespread isolation has also accelerated the development of online platforms for training and homes. Uh, mobile apps become an integral part of everyday life and help organize our daily routine, uh, proper nutrition, and individual workouts. 
Uh, so, talking about the Ministry of Sports of the Russian Federation, it has launched the internet portal Train at Home uh, to train and to keep fit at home while quarantine. Finally, many sport associations and organizations were able to develop new strategies and the result was impressive. Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin approved new strategy for development of physical culture and sport in uh, Russian Federation until 2013. The International Association of uh, Women Professional Tennis held a large-scale rebranding campaign. Borussia Dortmund Soccer Club has organized uh, a visual tour of Asia. And the, finally, NBA is using a partnership with Microsoft to attract fans to the virtual standards, like in AR and VR industry. So basically, here's our presentation. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, so uh, maybe some questions from our experts. May I? <laughs> of course, of course, Olga. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Uh, that was very interesting to listen to your speech. Um, uh, being not only professor, but also mother, I'm very concerned about um, a cyber spot development, of course. Uh, do you know some research how it affects um, health of a child or an adult? Uh, do they estimate somehow the impact on our, uh, I don't know, of site? Uh, possibilities and so on, because it, could, it can damage a lot of things. Also, mental health can be damaged. Uh, do you know something about that? Uh, may I answer? So, we didn't analyze the exact uh, impact on uh, the mental health, but what we can uh, uh, definitely answer is that research showed that during the pandemic time, we were really isolated and we needed to somehow communicate with each other and as a result cyber sports helped not only to raise funds for the organization of sports events and athletes but also to some extent to compensate for the lack of the real communication during the quarantine period so children's ch children and uh, adults they tried to communicate through the cyber activities and they stayed in connection so I think for this period exact, it even helped. Okay, maybe. I think it's a good, uh, could be a good research for you to follow this uh, topic. Uh, because when you have this and you are involved in this, uh, after that, it's very difficult to get rid of this. It's like a drug. Um, uh, so we should follow this as a research as me, Maria, maybe, Kirill, and of course, you young students. Uh, not to make the situation more difficult for our uh, people from healthcare industry, I think. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And thank you for your question and for your comments. It's, uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so next, I think that um, we will uh, go to Ilya Lapshin. Uh, so, yes, our student, uh, yeah, please welcome. Hello, dear colleagues. My name is Ilya Lapshin. I'm glad you're all here and I'm very happy to tell you about the assessment of bookmaker organizations impact on sports industry. To begin with, as you all know, the 2020 was a wacky, crazy year. The next slide, please. Um, when we pay close attention to the sports industry outlook, we can distinguish top three industry-wide opportunities and threats. Since everyone was forced to stay at home, everyone has come online. And as a result, now we have an enhanced digital fan experience due to the increased consumer demand in digital services. As a result, providers had to come up with creation and monetization of digital content. As a result, and escalation in revenues. Now service providers and operators have to think of innovation of media rights packaging and distribution, since the environment has become fiercely competitive. 
Speaking of threats, of course, an impact of health and safety crisis, reduced financial resources to invest and innovate, the consolidation of the market and the dominance of major tech firms as gateway to content. But frankly, we see this, but frankly, we see this trend across any other industry in the world though. The next slide, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, a very bright spot during the 2020, a win for revenues and fan engagement. The sports industry as a whole has experienced multiple points of revenue disruption in 2020, but a potential bright spot for 2021 and beyond will be continued advancement of the sports gambling market and the strategic revenue opportunities it could create for sports leagues, teams, and their partners. The current trend is that consumers are engaging with gambling platforms at a record pace, and this user base continues to grow. I suggest that we should take a particular look at the US gambling market as it has outpaced any other sports betting market on the globe. According to the most recent research conducted by the American Gaming Association, the NFL, MLB, NBA, and NHL leagues alone stand to gain a collective $4.3 billion of dollars annually in direct and indirect revenues from legal sports gambling. The revenues come largely from partnerships with sports gambling operators, but, but some also come from increased fun engagement that can boost merchandising, sponsorship, advertising, and ticket sales. So how did bookmakers survive the pandemic? Well, they didn't survive, they just thrived during that time. And while the sports industry has suffered from the pandemic, the online gaming and gambling industry has continued to grow rapidly. Americans, for example, spent approximately $4 billion on sports wagering, according to the American Gaming Association research. Legal sports betting took in a record 1.5 billion in revenue in 2020, up 69% year over year. This remarkable chain of circumstances has resulted in the extraordinary popularity of electronic sports. And I believe not everyone here knew about electronic sports market and particularly about electronic sports gambling market, which saw an increase of more than 40 times last year. So why did that happen? The novel coronavirus pandemic has completely shifted the pattern of growth in the sports industry. Sports simulation titles have exploded thanks to the cancellation of major sports. Showing significant growth, the electronic sports betting turnover is projected to surge past $14 billion this year. These values have doubled compared to $7 billion last year. The recent growth of electronic sports betting should also help drive the global electronic sports market to, to reach a value of $3 billion by 2025. This immense growth of esports during the pandemic also, unsurprisingly, accelerated the development of the electronic sports betting sector. And instead of considering whether or not to offer esports at all, most betting companies started looking for the best ways to do it. As a result, B2B collaborations began to boom. In the process of replacing traditional sports and increasing the betting volume, sports books added more competitive electronic sports events in their portfolio and also had to secure data providers with wider coverage. But how, but how, does, but how do bookmaker organizations impact the sports industry? We just saw all the latest trends and changes within the sports industry and the sports gambling market and the opportunities it created. So the first important thing here is that sports gambling sustains the integrity of sports. The battle against fixed games, for example, is in the process and the number of fixed games continues to decrease. And the pace with which the legal bookmakers push the illegal bookmakers out of the market is also very important. Secondly, sports gambling opportunities create a holistic fan experience, both on digital platforms and on stadium. Thanks to this holistic experience, we have an increased fan engagement, the new level of fan immersion into sports. And if we combine all these things together, we see a substantial revenue game for everyone. 
for leagues, clubs, players, and sports industry partners. If taken right, bookmaker organizations and sports gambling market Im- create immense opportunities for all parties involved. The numbers and trends just show you that. Thank you very much. Don't hesitate to uh, ask your questions. Thank you so much, Ilya. Uh, so, of course, the uh, bookmaker organizations will influence the sport industry. And, of course, we understand that a big amount of money are in this uh, um, kind of sphere. And, uh, of course, uh, if we're talking about the sponsorship in the uh, sport industry, of course, we should uh, bear in mind that uh, bookmakers, organizations nowadays, uh, they're in the top. Um, and, of course, there are pluses and minuses uh, for the sport industry, for the amateurs and etc. cetera, but uh, we should work with them. And we should uh, find out uh, those ways that uh, will be more uh, common, more resultive for all of us. Thank you, Ilya. So the next, please, uh, Anna Haralgina. Okay. Welcome. Okay, now you can hear me. <laughs> Good day, everyone. Um, my name is Anna Koralgina, and today I'm going to talk about uh, sport as an effective platform for brand promotion. And first of all, let's talk about how sport can be valuable for brands and marketing. Sport is a spectacular event which provides true emotions. It's true that fans have uh, an emotional connection with clubs, leagues, and sports and themselves. This connection is important for brand loyalty. Corporate social responsibility is a global paramount trend. Uh, Supporting socially significant events is vital for a brand image. Sport fans themselves are consumers with common needs. uh, We remember they have an emotional connection. Uh, It's easy for brands to enter the international market as they can support international sport competitions. Sport is always a news break or a sensation. And least and last but not least, sport has a strong association with victory and success, which is which also favors the image immensely. In marketing, it is accepted that the best way to integrate brand in sport is sponsorship. Sponsorship is the financial support we receive from sponsor. Here there are plenty of cases of brand, brand sponsorship. Here is the best practice. Uh, Olympic game is the brightest example of business and sport integration. Olympic even have permanent top sponsors. For example, the games of 2018 attracted 82 brands, which was a terrific number. Coca-Cola has a best result uh, for of a social media interaction while and after FIFA. Uh, they, ha- they gained about um, 530 million interactions across that year. That's big. Uh, Skoda and Ice Hockey World Championship have had, have had a long period of cooperation for nearly 27 years. They, these cases show brands' interest in sport as a platform for promotion. After the pandemic, the situation has changed dramatically. To survive, the sport industry must adapt the new, to the new reality. Let's see some trends. Um, we all know that live sports events are viewed on social media or broadcast. It is comfortable and easily ac- accessible. However, it's quite common nowadays that people particularly sleep with their mobile phones. They, have, they are online 24 and 7 and they get all necessary information by phone, social media and apps. Also, import esports continues to evolve uh, and uh, the brands have to hunt new young audience but uh, they struggle for any unique content, so they invest in um, this. They start for unique content, so they invest in intellectual property. Um, so you ask me, what else? What is the future of sponsorship in sports? And I say that it can develop too, but for this, you need to take uh, into account trends and uh, the current situation. 
One of the aims of any sport organization is to save the relationship with sponsor. So club league, so here my recommendation, uh, club leagues or sports must be able to provide an active communication with their audience online, by social media, mobile apps, broadcasts, and others. Um, it is good time for eSport to main uh, to eSport to evolve and the main goal will be to attract adults and solvent audience. And uh, I'd recommend to be more creative and perceive the economic goals of a partner, not only image for the placement of logos, but uh, realize native communications. Thanks for listening. That's it. I'm ready for the questions. Thank you so much, Anna. Olga Palma, you'd like to? Yes, I have a question. Uh, Anna, you know me. I was a thank you, Martin. <laughs> so I am Good very happy. You. I am very happy that you have chosen such a, an interesting topic like branding. You were speaking about uh, branding and sport. Um, and you told that uh, the um, industry was not very flexible. Uh, and uh, as others also said, uh, uh, the situation was not good. But maybe you know some good examples when our, uh, some athletes uh, increased their brand um, equity during pandemic. Uh, because brand is not only about uh, short-term money, it's building a long-term thing. Maybe you know such examples. Yeah, I know one integration with uh, Russian brand Megaphone with uh, football clubs. They uh, created um, eSport football competitions uh, so the real professional footballers could play online. Uh, while, of course, pandemic, so they couldn't do it uh, outside uh, in real life. So I'd like, I really like that case. And I think it's uh, have a way to uh, realize its potential in the future. Yeah. You know, I was surprised by the behavior of Cristiano Ronaldo during this pandemic. Yeah. He, he increased his brand a lot. Mm -hmm. How he behaved, how he uh, restructured his business. And the whole world started uh, respecting him more. I, I have never been his fan. I'm more for Messi. <laughs> but in this situation, he was like, like a um, trendsetter, I would say. His behavior uh, inspired many others. So I think it's, it depends on the company and the uh, brain you have and mm -hmm. the ability to change. So everything is possible. You should not cry. And yeah. wait, what, what, what's going to happen? tomorrow will uh, recover one day yeah I, I i agree with you that's true we have the potential uh to uh, be better <laughs> otherwise the sport industry have a real potential you just need yeah. to do that thank you very much thank you thank you so much anna and welcome uh, tom diakonov um please also, student of Institute of Finance and Sustainable Development. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, being, uh, being at this virtual floor, first of all, I want to thank uh, all the organizers of this forum, of this forum experts, as well as speakers before me. Uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so, uh, turning now to my research, the prospects for changing the relationship of professional athletes, sports leagues, and sports federations. Uh, this, topics, uh, this topic explores the history of the changing role of financial institutions in the international Olympic movement, beginning since uh, the late 60s and the subsequent expansion of international sports organizations by major sports sponsors, uh, which can be observed today. This problem was considered by me both on the example of the IOC and the, on the current confrontation of the International Swimming Federation and uh, with the International Swimming League. So throughout the history of the development of modern sports, 
commercializations, uh, commercialization has always been a continuous process. Even the founder of the Olympic movement, Pierre de Coubertin, and his associates paid uh, particular attention to amateur sports. Athletes who receive, who received rewards for training and participation in competitions were depri deprived of the opportunity to participate in the Olympic Games. So in the middle of 60s, the American multimillionaire Avery Brandesh, a president of the IOC, actively fought against the invasion of the sports and the Olympic movement. He managed them at the cost of his own image to resist the manufacture of ski equipment and other financial organizations. And uh, in the 70s, an attempt to create professional athletes uh, circuses failed. But the new head of the Olympic Committee, Juan Antonio Samaraj, uh, in 1980 made a global adjustment to the basic principles of not only the Olympic movement, but uh, also the sports movement as a whole through the creation of a network of IOC top partners. The top partners. You see the differences between the, uh, this slide between the first programs and uh, the current program. The development of uh, world sports has led to an increase in its popularity, therefore to an increase in the financial significance of sports and other pro processes, accompanying uh, the growth of the popularity of unsocial events. So, uh, uh, Olympic Games in 1984 in Los Angeles became the first commercial games. As for the restrictions in the form of uh, financing, the training and participation of athletes in competitions in uh, 1986 at the uh, uh, 91st session of the IOC in Lausanne, it was decided that professional athletes are allowed to participate in the competitions of the Olympic Games. At present, when over the past 25 years, amateur sports have finally turned into professional sports. And the next stage has begun uh, the takeover of, uh, of world sports by international foundation corporations. International sports federations and even the International Olympic Committee uh, find it increasingly difficult to compete with commercial leagues. The reason is contract. Uh, contract conditions for athletes and growing salaries that sports federations can provide. Until now, until now, the immutable structure of the OEC and international sports federations is under threat. Since it is possible for a number of commercial structures to organize their own, uh, their own uh, competitive league, which will compete with international competitions and the species of the federation. The key object to be shared by both sides is uh, Athletes who can both earn good money by competing in different uh, tournaments at the same time or harm their health and uh, fall under various sanctions from both sides. So one of the most striking examples today is uh, the opposition between International Swimming Federation, uh, FINA, and the International Swimming League, ISL. In uh, 2017, FINA reported total revenue of more than uh, 200 uh, million francs. Between, uh, for the period from uh, 2015 and 2017. With, and um, the price pool uh, was only 24 million for athletes. So you can, uh, you can see the differences. We see a certain imbalance uh, between uh, 200 million and 24 million, in which the athletes who organize the main competitive entertainment receive a small part of the fee. So, uh, the, next, uh, the next step uh, was that FINA has announced a new champion swim series with a prize pool uh, about uh, 4 million uh, francs, where swimmers will be grouped by continental or sponsorship, and each team will consist of uh, 12 athletes. So the concept is in fact a copy of a competition previously proposed by the International Swimming League, which uh, planned a regular season with uh, 12 clubs equally divided between Europe and uh, the United States. But moreover, um, FINA using its powers refused to authorize the ISL competition and warned its swimmers that the athletes would face disqualification for, participa for participating in the competition of the ISL. However, a number of famous athletes, uh, also such, uh, such as Michael Phelps, have uh, filled a class action lawsuit. And this has led FINA to withdraw the threat against the athletes and relax its rules regarding third party, third party competitions. So commercial leagues dictate their terms and claim the current sports guidelines are no longer valid. 
in leagues, swimmers can receive at least about 50% of the income from the competition organizers. So also one of the most example, uh, uh, one of the most example situation was the, was the IOC is also experiences its own difficult difficulties in dealing with the National Hockey League, which resulted in the absence of the strongest hockey players at the Pyeongchang Olympic Games in, 20, in 2018. IOC President Thomas Bach has called of National Olympic Committee to work with their governments to protect the European model of sport from the perceived threat of commercial enterprises. The current situation is characterized by the commercialization of sport and the Olympic movement, radio seizure by international financial groups and corporations. So there is no particular optimism regarding the prospects for change. Moreover, during the pandemic, we began to observe the increase and, str and struggle of streaming services. In early, the struggle was for, was for TV rights. Now, internet uh, cor corporations such as Facebook have begun uh, to acquire exclusive content. In Russia, Kontakte and Rambler are seriously competing with federal TV channels such as Match TV. But uh, can we exclude the fact that such internet resources will uh, not themselves you know, become the organizers of the competition? Of course not which is why the International Olympic Committee and the sports federations are creating their own content promotion channels, such as uh, Olympic Channel and uh, Tina TV. So thank you very much for the attention. For the attention and uh, I'm ready to hear you. I think that uh, I'm too nervous today. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much, Artyom. Um... So, uh, if we sum up our uh, section uh, concerning um, sport trends, uh, sport development, uh, what trends we will have, of course, we should think about main features of it. First of all, we should uh, speak about the scientific research, because uh, without uh, science, we can't do nothing. I think all of the students, all of the experts uh, know these. Uh, the second point is, uh, of course, the future medicine, because uh, without uh, medicine, without new trends that we have, without um, new trends in medicine that we can use for uh, making our athletes uh, more resultive, of course, we can't do nothing. Uh, the third point is, of course, uh, new constructions, because infrastructure in our sphere is very, very important. Of course, nowadays we have a lot of stadiums, a new one after um, football championship, uh, for example. Yes, we have. But the main problem here is how we use this, how effective we are. And uh, of course, uh, new constructions and new infrastructure, of course, will uh, also will help us to develop the sphere. Then, of course, we should think about mass sport and, of course, professional sport. Uh, two different things. Also, we should think how we can develop the one point and another. Uh, then, of course, we should uh, talk about and think about how the COVID situation influenced the sports sphere. And um, we should understand really and critically that uh, the situation with the COVID can be in a next year, uh, in some other periods, uh, we should uh, use our, um, we should use our knowledge uh, for the, for the uh, next time. Uh, we should nowadays think about the uh, online format of the sport events. We should think how we should work with our uh, audience uh, how we um, should work with the sponsors 
And that is the main also question. A uh, big point, it's about uh, the brand promotion, uh, how we work with sponsors, um, how we should work with book, uh, bookmakers, organizations. That is also the main trend. Because uh, if we'd like to have a good sports event, we should find out money, we should find out uh, people who will do, we should find um, athletes, we should make the show. If not, it will be not uh, effective, it will be not uh, with a big result. For example, that's match day in United States. That's the show. But it is a connection of show with the sport affect that influence people to go and to think how my body should be in future, what I should do for being really um, with a good um, sportive form what I should do with this. And this is your own motivation. And all these trends will give us some impact to be more healthy, more, more athletic, uh, to understand the life uh, in the whole spectrum of colors. So I wish all of you Good luck. I would like to thank all our experts, all the students, and um, I hope that um, this uh, session will give you some interesting information that you can use in your future research. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, today I think I will stop and um, so have a nice day and uh, please welcome to another sessions that we have in the Student Guide R Forum. Bye-bye.